Welcome to worship for the week of July 5th at and with Trinity Lutheran Church in St. Petersburg, Florida. Trinity is a Reconciling in Christ congregation of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. We strive to welcome all people to be active members of our congregation and to teach us about their faith journey, including those who have experienced marginalization or exclusion elsewhere. Today's service will include the sharing of Holy Communion. That poses some risk for those here in the sanctuary with me. Even though the sacrament is being offered, no one is ever obligated to come forward and receive it. I encourage those watching a recording of the service to find something in your home that you can use as bread and wine so that you can receive communion when it is offered here in the sanctuary. If you have a printed bulletin for this service, you can use the QR code to make a financial contribution to the church. You can also use our website, trinitylutheransaintpete.org, or you can just mail a check to us. The July issue of our church newsletter has been published. You should have received it by email. Printed copies are available from the church office. If you aren't receiving regular emails from the church and you wish to, just give us a call and ask to be added to our distribution lists. We have called a special congregational meeting that will be held through phone calls and emails on or after July 6th for members to vote on whether we should serve as the site to train a seminary intern. This week, we offer our congratulations to Phil Rerick on the birth of his granddaughter, Claire. We wish a happy birthday to the United States of America, to Arlene James and to Michelle Richards, and we wish a happy anniversary to Mike and Diana Shipley. For the foreseeable future, our Sunday worship services will continue to be pre-recorded and made available on our website. Our evening prayer services are live streamed on Facebook every Wednesday at 6.30. We are gathering through the medium of Zoom for a book study and for fellowship. If you want some more information about those gatherings, please call the church office. And now, I invite you to take a moment to prepare your heart and mind to encounter God in worship.
Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose steadfast love is everlasting, whose faithfulness endures from generation to generation. Amen. Amen. Trusting, O God, in your unchanging mercy, we confess our failure to live according to your values. Reconciling God, we confess that we do not trust your abundance and we deny your presence in our lives. We place our hope in ourselves and rely on our own efforts. We fail to believe that you provide enough for all. We abuse your good creation for our own benefit. We fear difference and do not welcome others as you have welcomed us. We sin in thought, word, and deed. By your grace, forgive us. Through your love, renew us and in your spirit lead us, so that we may live and serve you in newness of life. Amen. Beloved children of God, by the radical abundance of divine mercy, we have peace with God through Christ Jesus, through whom we have obtained grace upon grace. Our sins are forgiven. Let us live now in hope, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Let us pray. You are great, O God, and greatly to be praised. You have made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. Grant that we may believe in you, call upon you, know you, and serve you. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. The prayer that we just offered is based on the opening sentences of a book called The Confessions, written by the man for whom the city of St. Augustine is named, a bishop who lived in northern Africa back at the beginning of the fifth century. His words express the belief that human beings are created with a need and a longing for God. Today's scriptures ask, who is the God for whom we are restless? Throughout the Old Testament book of Zechariah, God is presented as a violent warrior who destroys our enemies. But in today's reading, the end of all violence is celebrated as God makes a humble entry into the city of Jerusalem. Many of our psalms talk about God's steadfast love being reserved for the ancient Israelites. Psalm 145 makes a point of saying that God's love is offered to every person and every nation on earth. In his letter to the Romans, to show how we need to be rescued by God, the Apostle Paul gives a vivid description of how if we want to live a life that is pleasing to God, we cannot rely on our own strength or will to do it. And in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus says that our claims of wisdom and intelligence won't help us to comprehend God. But if we trust in God's self-revelation, we can then be set free from life's burdens. A reading from Zechariah. Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you. Triumphant and victorious is he, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. He will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall command peace to the nations. His dominion shall be from sea to sea, and from the river to the ends of the earth. As for you also, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit, Return to your stronghold, O prisoners of hope. Today I declare that I will restore to you double. The word of the Lord. Tell 
of the glory of your kingdom and speak of your power that all people may know of your power and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Your dominion endures throughout all ages. You, Lord, are faithful in all your works and loving in all your works. The Lord upholds all those who fall and lifts up those who are bowed down. understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now if I do what I do not want, I agree that the law is good, but in fact it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells within me that is in my flesh. I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer that I do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do what is good, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God, in my inmost self. But I see in my members another law at war with the law of my mind, making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Word of God, Word of Life. The Good News of God's Love According to Matthew. Glory to you, o Lord. Now when Jesus had finished instructing his twelve disciples, he went on from there to teach and proclaim his message in their cities. When John heard in prison what the Messiah was doing, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, are you the one who is to come, or are we to wait for another? Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have good news brought to them. And blessed is anyone who takes no offense at me. As they went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds, saying, 
from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John came. And if you are willing to accept it, he is Elijah who is to come. Let anyone with ears listen. At that time, Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This is the Gospel of the Lord. The kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. The kingdom of heaven, whatever it is, is an important theme in the Gospel of Matthew. Back in chapter 3 of the book, John the Baptist appears in the wilderness proclaiming, the kingdom of heaven has come near. After John is arrested, Jesus begins his ministry in Galilee by proclaiming, the kingdom of heaven has come near. When he sends out his disciples to minister to the lost sheep of Israel, Jesus tells them to proclaim the good news, the kingdom of heaven has come near. But that's only after he's preached his Sermon on the Mount that begins with the words, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who are persecuted, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In a couple of weeks, we'll hear Jesus offer a series of parables that begin with the words, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a mustard seed, some yeast, a farmer who sows good seed, a treasure hidden in a field, a merchant in search of fine pearls, a net that is thrown into the sea. It's hard to describe what exactly the kingdom of heaven is, but according to Jesus, in the few months between John's ministry and his, the kingdom is something that has suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. What does he mean? To be honest, I'm not sure. But the alternative seems to be to come to Jesus so that he can give us rest, to learn from his gentleness and his humility by taking his yoke onto our shoulders. A big clue to what he might be talking about can be found back in the Sermon on the Mount when, after saying that some unlikely people already possess the kingdom, Jesus warns us that 
unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. The scribes and the Pharisees are extremely devout people who pay a lot of attention to obeying every last one of God's commandments. In his sermon, Jesus then goes on to describe how hard it is to attempt to obey even one of the commandments. You have heard that it was said thus, but I say to you thus. He finishes up the sermon by saying, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. Well, what is the Father's will if it isn't that we obey divine commandments? I think that the Father's will is that we place all of our trust and all of our hope in the Father's love and the Father's unfathomable mercy. Psalm 145 describes God's glorious splendor and power. And then it says that they are offered to every person who has fallen through the cracks or been crushed by oppression. The all-powerful God upholds all those who fall and lifts up those who are bowed down. The one who has all of the power extends it to those who have none. We don't find God because we rely on our own wisdom and intelligence and search really hard. We find the God that we desire because God reveals God's self to us. Weak and powerless as we are, in the person and ministry and death and resurrection of Jesus. We don't know if Jesus intended to use the words of the prophet Zechariah as the model for his triumphal entry into the city of Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, but we know that the authors of our Gospels made the connection. Today's passage from Zechariah celebrates peace, but the rest of the book is bloody and violent. The beginning of today's chapter describes the destruction of each one of Israel's ancient enemies. The very next verse after today's reading says, I will arouse your sons, O Zion, against your sons, O Greece, and wield you like a warrior's sword. That's why the people of Galilee and Judea were expecting a savior who was going to lead them into battle to destroy the Roman Empire and purge the world of sin and evil. That's why John the Baptist had to ask, are you the one who was promised to us? Or should we be looking for somebody else? According to Zechariah, it is only after destroying the nation's enemies that the king enters Jerusalem humbly and peaceably. What actually happened was that Jesus first entered the city in humility so that he could then submit himself to the power of God's enemies. He suffered and died to save all human beings from sin and death. Zechariah's word describing the king as humble could also mean impoverished or vulnerable. This king identifies himself with the weakest of his subjects, the poor and the oppressed. This king promises to set us free, but until then, we are the prisoners of hope. 
Are we hopeful despite our imprisonment? Or are we imprisoned by our hope? While hope is a common topic in the New Testament, it really isn't mentioned much in the Hebrew Scriptures. When it is, it's usually in a phrase like a vain hope, which describes placing our trust in anything other than God. Last week, we heard the Apostle Paul offer us the choice of enslaving ourselves to sin or enslaving ourselves to God. Sin, we know, isn't just the harmful things that we might do or think or say. Sin is about our whole approach to life. In today's reading from Romans, Paul describes an important aspect of being enslaved to sin, trying through your own strength or will to live a life that is pleasing to God. You can sin by trying really hard to earn God's approval. Now this is part of Paul's long and complicated argument about the relationship between God's law and God's grace. Paul says that the divine law is a good thing, but only in that it shows us how much we need God to save us from ourselves. Knowing what's good and not doing it is about more than the Ten Commandments. We know we should eat a healthy diet and get plenty of exercise, but we don't. By now, we know that we should wear a mask and practice social distancing, not for our own protection, but for that of our neighbor, and still we don't do it. We can overcome individual sinful temptations on our own, but we can't overcome the power that sin with a capital S holds over us. We're taught that we can accomplish anything if we just set our minds to it. But when it comes to offering love that is truly self-sacrificing to God or to our neighbor, we're a prisoner of hope if we place our hope in ourselves. It sounds so extreme when Paul says that nothing good dwells within us. It sounds like he has a really low opinion of human beings. But notice that he uses the word flesh, which is kind of his code word for a human being that isn't filled with the power of Jesus' resurrection, a person who is still controlled by the power of sin. When Paul wants to say something positive, he uses the word body instead of flesh. Your body is a temple for the Holy Spirit. Together we are the body of Christ. It's only without the power of Jesus that we are flesh. Without him, our body is only a body of death. Jesus rescues us from our body of death by freely accepting his own bodily death. He suffers and dies so that we can be set free from every force that tries to hold us in bondage. When we are set free from sin, we are set free from our fear and our shame and our compulsion to try and earn God's love. Now, just because it's impossible for me, relying on my own strength and will, to live a life that is pleasing to God, that doesn't mean that I shouldn't make the attempt. I just have to rely on God's strength more than my own and realize that I'll only be successful in as much as I allow Jesus 
to help me. Taking Jesus' yoke upon ourselves doesn't mean that we take it away from him. We yoke ourselves to him so that he can do most of the work of dragging our heavy burdens. We learn from Jesus by following the example of his gentleness and humility. Gentleness and humility become the compass points by which we guide ourselves through life's journey. They are the means by which we find rest for our restless souls. We are gentle with our neighbors and we are gentle with ourselves. We stop trying to break down the doors to the kingdom and we just allow Jesus to carry us over the threshold. To unity with one another and the whole creation, let us pray for the world we share. We pray for the church. Embrace us as we struggle to find our common ground. Hear us, O God. Your, Your mercy, mercy is great. great. We pray for the well-being of creation. Free us from apathy in our care of it. Hear us, O God. Your, Your mercy. We pray for the nations, especially our own. Help us to live up to the values presented in our founding documents. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. We pray for all in need that you would ease our burdens. We pray for anyone that we know to be sick 
or suffering in any way. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. We give thanks for the witness of those who have gone before us in a life of faith. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Receive these prayers, O God, and those that are too deep for words, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you all. And also with you. Let's find a way to share a sign of that peace with one another. I encourage you to reach out to someone by phone, by text, and let them know how much they are loved by you and loved by God. Please join me in the offering prayer, God of goodness and growth, all creation is yours. Water and word, wine and bread, these are signs of your abundant grace. Nourish us through these gifts that we might proclaim your steadfast love in our communities and in the world. Through Jesus Christ, our strength and our song. Amen. Before he sent us to proclaim the good news, before he suffered and died, on the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Because we are all yoked to Jesus and he's carrying all of our burdens, that means we are bound to one another even when we feel isolated and alone. But we can feel that bond when we join together to pray the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Come to the table. Receive food for life's journey.
The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. God of the welcoming table, in this meal we have feasted on your goodness and have been united by your presence among us. Empower us to go forth sustained by these gifts so that we may share your neighborly love with all. Through Jesus Christ, the giver of abundant life. Amen. Amen. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. May God the Creator, Jesus the Christ, and our Holy Comforter bless you and keep you in that eternal love. Amen. Peace, share your love. Thanks be to God.